And you. Um, do I need a microphone? No, no you're okay. Okay, so in that case, um, people do shout at me and wave at the back if you can't see me properly. Can you hear me properly like that? Yeah, yeah okay. Um, right. So, uh, well remembered, yes, today we're on the uh, one and two qubits, or the more qubits. Um, so, I'll be talking about the sort of vision that people have had for years now of scaling up ion track uh, quantum computing and to, um, firstly, I guess, the, the <coughs> sort of long held vision of building a real useful quantum computer and how many thousands of qubits that might be. Um, but of course, also, even if we can manipulate uh, more than, well, maybe 30, 40 qubits in a sufficiently controlled way, we can already make uh, a useful quantum simulator. So obviously the ideas of uh, the, the sort of long-term vision of building a quantum computer also apply in the more short term to something that might be much more immediately useful for simulating some quantum systems that are already too complicated to simulate on uh, regular classical computers. Uh, sort of supercomputer size we have today, which is limited to maybe 40 qubits. Um, and uh, I guess I will uh, probably be touching on some of the technical aspects of the um, ion trapping. Um, technical barriers and issues that the experimental community has come up with in the last uh, five or ten years since we've been exploring these ideas. So do forgive me for that. Um, one thing I'd also uh, like to tell you about in the second half of the talk is ideas for driving uh, quantum logic gates, making entangled states, using microwave fields instead of optical fields. So I talked mostly about, in, in the last lecture, about the two qubit gates and the concepts of using the laser. Um, and laser is fine, um, but control over optical fields at sufficient, um, with, with sufficient precision to do high fidelity quantum logic, the sort of fidelity we need for scaling and quantum computing is very challenging. Um, and it, in just in the last uh, couple of years, uh, ideas have come about having micro fields and said micros are basically much more mature technology that goes and buy um, off the shelf microwave frequency synthesizers which are incredibly stable. Um, and uh, what the whole range of microwave kit, you know, your mobile phone is uh, packed with little uh, microwave <coughs> and uh, that's uh, obviously a very mature technology since the dates from uh, at least 50 years ago. So there are some uh, uh, real technology advantages to, to working with microwaves, which might give us that itch uh, in reaching the sort of fidelity that we need to get. Um, so I'm going to tell you about some recent results um, from our lab in Oxford on a brand new qubit we've been using in Oxford. Um, and you know, we're in fact the first people to hear those results. Um, and as you've seen already on Diana Watt's poster, so the poster session, um, this is the first time they've had their public hearing in that hot off the press. Um, okay, so, um, so I'm going to talk about the vision for scalable quantum computing. I'm going to talk about a particular type of ion trap, which is very promising for scaling up, which is called a surface electrode ion trap or planar trap. Um, so I'm going to talk about microwave-driven quantum logic, how that works, and a particular trap which we've built to uh, realise that, at least a, a demonstration of that in Oxford, and this new uh, high-performance uh, qubit we've been using in the, the calcium-43 isotope. Um, okay, so the, um, this is a paper by my colleague Andrew Steen, three years old now, but I think it's still one of the most detailed papers about how you would actually scale up on track quantum information processing. He goes into a lot of numbers and details. Um, I don't want to go into details here, but I'm just picking out a few um, numbers from that abstract. Uh, he's talking about um, using 13,000 trapped ions around a chip containing 160,000 <coughs> electrodes using 1,000 laser beam pairs. So that's to, to realize this um, vision um, that came out of Boulder um, over 10 years ago, uh, as I mentioned in the other lecture about how you uh, scale the quantum computer by physically shuffling around these trapped ion qubits. Uh, and those, those numbers are pretty daunting. Telling you about one and two qubits and, and the state of the art being sort of eight or 14 entangled qubits in one particular ion track. So you know, scaling this up to thousands of qubits is uh, obviously hugely daunting, but I guess probably no less daunting to people um, 60 years ago who were thinking about scaling up classical computers before the invention of the transistors and so on. Um, so uh, th there are alternative routes, of course, to scaling <coughs> um, quantum information networks, if you want to call it, you can think about uh, entangling ions with photons or atoms with photons, and you can think about um, lattices of, of ion traps or neutral atom traps and so on. 
So um, there are alternatives, and I think they're probably uh, all at least equally daunting. Um, let's give you some numbers about where the uh, state of the art of the field is at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, ions make extremely good quantum memory qubits. Um, so the quantum coherence times that you can measure the T2 sum of the qubits are the, uh, the longest in, uh, I'm aware of in any physical system, especially for single qubits. Um, T2 sums of order seconds are continually uh, achieved if you, if you protect that with a spin echo pulse, as I showed you an example of in the previous lecture, that uh, extends to time scale of uh, order a minute. So they're very good memory qubits. Um, we can do deterministic quantum logic, by which I mean uh, I'm post selecting events where I have to entangle a state. By chance, I'm really entangling states on demand. Um, and the record for a two qubit uh, gate fidelity uh, using lasers uh, set by the Innsbruck group I mentioned yesterday 99.3%, and that's the sort of time scale uh, 50 microseconds. Uh, we can do other, some other qubit operations. Um, qubit readout, I'll talk to you in detail about that. Um, we can also control our cubes. I, I, I talked about when I was talking about gates, I talked about how important it is to have control over the motion, because it's the motion of the trapped ions which mediates quantum logic gates. Um, and we can cool them without losing the coherence um, by the technique of sympathetic cooling. So, uh, in that technique, we put in, uh, I'm just a brief here in the context of scaling up, you put in two different ion species in the same trap, um, and you, you, you cool one of them. Uh, which is called your refrigerator ion, if you like, and the other one is where you keep your quantum logic. And because they interact strongly by the cooling interaction, um, you can cool one of them, that cools the, both of them down, without affecting the delicate quantum information that's stored in your logic hub, which is because there's a, uh, that the two ions, the two different species, respond to different frequencies of your later cooling. Right. Um, so, uh, again, we did a, a demonstration of a, a few years ago with two different isotopes of calcium. And those experiments have been pursued by Jonathan Holm and others at um, NIST in, in recent years using two completely different species of iron, for example, brilliant iron and magnesium iron, that have been using their experiments. And uh, then you can do that very, very well because different atoms, of course, have completely different uh, transition frequencies. So you can really uh, do that very carefully. Um, so that, those sort of systems have been used to perform simple algorithms like teleportation. Um, <coughs> Most de first demonstrations of quantum error correction, um, and uh, all, all the operations you need to make a <coughs> universal two qubit processor. They have demonstrated all the operations you need, like the single qubit operations and the gates, all in the same um, trap. In the same. Mm -hmm. I put simple in inverted commas there because those are enormously complicated experiments. So if you look into the details of what actually goes into one of those experiments, building these ion traps with separate zones, we have to move the ions around. Uh, fantastic good control of all these electric fields and moving the ions around without heating them up too much or just kicking them out of the trap. Um, hundreds and hundreds of laser pulses needing to be applied to cool that iron motion, do the quantum logic, read out there. So it's, it, um, it's really uh, state of the art stuff and very tough and complicated experiments. Um, and a lot of groups are looking at the sort of technology side of things um, how, do we, how do we scale up? The microfabrication technologies do need to make as much bigger traps than many, many electrons. And so on. Okay, so um, I showed you a picture of a trap uh, yesterday, which was uh, an old um, linear trap. It was the first trap we built in Oxford, a traditional sort of macroscopic trap. That's the real thing, we built in a workshop and so on. And uh, that was fine. Um, mm -hmm. a great experiment in that, but it's, it's clearly not really a scalable technology. It doesn't match this vision of how hundreds or even thousands of things But more fundamentally, um, because the electrodes are in a three-dimensional array, um, it's very difficult to see how you could um, make these junctions of traps and so on. Like it's very difficult. So it can be done with three-dimensional traps. Um, but there's a, a, a very promising approach, uh, which was uh, invented and pioneered about uh, uh, five or six years ago. It's the idea of planar traps. We have a planar trap because we have all the electrodes in the ion trap organized in a plane. 
two-dimensional rotor. And yet, we can track the arms above that plane. That seems quite surprising at first when we think about it. If we find these arms by electric fields, how do we can find arms above the surface? Well, the electric fields are generally you can just repel them or attract them to the surface. Um, so here's how it works. You, that, that's the standard for three-dimensional design again, so the picture. And what we're seeing down here then is um, here's the here's electrodes. So these are these four volt electrodes at the end view. And this is the, um, the uh, sort of cover map of the potential, which is trapping the arm. Okay, so there's a minimum here on the trap axis, that's where the arm will trap. Okay, that's the same as the picture I just showed. And if you deform these electrodes down into a plane, okay, so here's our uh, gray as a substrate here. Blue are the radio frequency electrodes, and the yellow ones here are uh, DC electrodes um, on some sort of insulating dielectric substrate. And here again at the end view, that's, that's the electrodes, and um, this is what the potential surface is looking like <coughs> above that surface. And there is still, I'm just about to see there, a dark spot, so there's a minimum of potential. So the electric field lines, we actually want to plot them around, they're bending over here um, from the direct electrodes to the DC electrodes, which is essentially ground for the radio frequency. So if you, you can follow, follow those um, potential lines, you still get uh, a tracking quadrupole above the surface. Okay, so um, that, that's a very nice idea because it enormously simplifies the fabrication and the scaling up ideas of these kind of tracks. However, as you might imagine, um, there is a sort of escape route for the arms this way. Although, although there's a trap, there is a low potential barrier in that direction the arms can escape by. So for a given voltage on the electrodes, this trap is somehow shallower, and that's one of the technical challenges. So for example, it means you have to work very hard to make sure your vacuum in the experiment is pretty good, so that there aren't many collisions from background gas atoms, because background gas atoms can more easily knock your arms out of the trap. So that, that's one of the challenges. Um, there's no such thing as a free lunch, of course. Um, so uh, we built, um, a few years ago, a simple surface trap. Um, so this was uh, the first surface trap we built. It was the first uh, um, like microfabricated trap of any kind. That's that's what the actual thing looks like. Uh, this is also the actual thing actually from above using uh, a view with an electron microscope just to um, give an idea of the um, uh, quality of the, the electrode. So it's made by simple photolithography. It's gold on top of a quartz substrate. Um, it's all a single layer design, um, and we just made it ourselves in Cleveland and Oxford. And you can see it's got these. The RF rails along here, um, everything else is DC electrodes, which we can find easy control rules just to. Um, one novel feature was that the central electrode in between the RF electrodes is split in two, uh, and that's for a technical reason, it allows you to rotate the trap axes, um, uh, which enables you to do the laser cooling of the arms uh, easily, whilst retaining a nice uh, symmetrical design. And uh, you can see the sort of set, size scale of those electrodes is um, about uh, 100 microns to 200 microns. Um, I should say, by the way, the guy who really um, drove this project was uh, one of our students, David Inkpop. Um, it was really his ambition to do this. He felt that the company was going to actually go out and do it. He saw the results coming out of a couple of groups uh, in the States. And uh, he did an amazing job on this. He just went from the idea of doing it to designing it to sorting out how to fabricate it all the feeling. Got the trap working with his space not much more than a year. And uh, he actually put us in the leading Europe in this area. It was the first trap that anyone, surface trap anyone made. So um, there's the design um, again in a bit more detail. First up is what the potential looks like. Uh, this, this split central electrode, as I mentioned, enables you to tilt, rotate the potential. Um, and that's important because the laser beams in a surface trap basically have to come parallel to the substrate. Um, otherwise, you scatter a huge amount of light into your detection system and you wouldn't be able to see your ions at all. So um, the reason that's important is if you're if you have this symmetrical trap design, originally your trap principal axes are parallel and perpendicular to the plane of the trap, and your laser beam will pull this motion in this direction very effectively, but not motion in that direction. If you can tilt the principal axes, then uh, it pulls both the transverse motion. So that's a tip uh, reason. So we've also been collaborating for a number of years with some guys at Sandia National Labs in the States who have access to a huge billion dollar silicon chip fabrication. <coughs> radiation-hardened um, 
choices in this room. I'm really for using nuclear weapons, but also for using things like uh, uh, probes that go to Jupiter and Saturn with these harsh radiation environments. And uh, they can do wonderful replication of things. They took Davis' design and turned it into a, uh, a, a three-dimensional design. So it's sort of playing a track, but you can see from these close-ups that, uh, that what they're able to do is stand the electrons electrodes off and hide the insulating material and so on. So that, there's some advantages to this. Um, and another thing we've done outside in Oxford is we've taken this a step further and built um, a trap in Oxford in this, this microwave quantum module. So this is a second generation trap. Um, and again, this is, this is a world first bit of technology. This is a um, world being a surface trap. It actually incorporates microwave circuit elements on the, on the trap itself. And nobody's done that. Okay, so first let me tell you about um, uh, an experiment we did on laser cleaning. So this is a, a sort of technical thing. We produced this trap that's made by Sandia. And the reason we got into this was because of an issue called anomalous heating in the ion trap community. So, so we're trying to do quantum logic using the motion of motion of these ions. Okay. Any noise in the electric field that's trapping those ions tends to heat them up. And that means the quantum control that which gets more. So what has empirically been found over the years, uh, here's a summary plot of the data of well, lots and lots of uh, different uh, ion trap groups over the last uh, about 10 years when people have been measuring this, is the electric field of noise um, as a function of the distance between your ions and the, the trap surface in the surface trap or the nearest trap electron. So the, the thing that people have empirically found, as you might imagine, is that when you get closer and closer to the surface, this noise gets much, much worse. <coughs> but, Nobody really understands what the origin of this noise is. So uh, it's aware very widely in different traps and different uh, surfaces and uh, so on. Um, and the one thing that is very clear is it's way above any fundamental noise. So the fundamental noise that you get from, uh, as usually in electronics, is limited by Johnson noise. And the, the noise that is measured here is many, many also magnitude above Johnson noise. So, so there's various bits of evidence that it's, it's something to do with surface. same trap and you clean it in different ways, you can measure different heating rates. Um, people have built, uh, in the high Chuang's group at MIT, they've, they've built many different types of ion trap, including uh, ion traps made out of superconducting electrodes. So that they thought if they build this out of superconducting, it would below the uh, critical point of the superconductor, they might see something interesting happening. In fact, there was no change in this effect at all. And that, again, was evidence that this thing to the surface of the superconductor, that, that effect was happening inside the superconductor. Um, and uh, people also, also observe that, that if they um, have different kind of multi-zone traps where they have a zone where they load it on a heater from their atomic beam, then the heating rate in that area seems to get worse over time as presumably crap from the atomic beam gets uh, spread onto the, uh, spread onto the surface of the ion trap. So what nobody had attempted to do, um, so we did this experiment, was actually see if you could clean off um, the surface in a trap that you had mounted. So what we did was we took a um, pulsed Yang laser, so this is a, a laser that emits high energy pulses. Um, uh, it's a very standard device that's uh, used in surface science, and you can, there are um, areas that are experimentally being done on cleaning surfaces using high energy pulse lasers. So you're just blasting stuff off the surface. And we applied it to one of these traps. Um, it has some advantages that, um, compared with other cleaning methods, all you have to do is shine the lasers to the window of your vacuum system, uh, blast it, blast it stuff off. You don't have to uh, put uh, any other sort of gas in there, like discharge cleaning and so on. And uh, uh, amazingly, this idea actually worked. Um, so this is some data we took um, as a function of the trap frequency here, but again, it's basically the, the, the y axis here is just measuring the noise in the system, and before and after cleaning. So um, this, is, this is before cleaning here, this is after cleaning. The reduction of uh, roughly a factor of two in this noise. And all the time we were playing, in order to convince ourselves we were seeing something real, all the time this is a multi zone trap, we were using two different zones. So we kept one zone pristine, untouched, and that was our control experiment. We moved the iron over to the other zone, which was clean, <coughs> the heater right there, move it back again, and chip the heater, and we still get um, So we saw a factor of two improvement, we were pretty pleased by this. Um, uh, and then, um, uh, about six 
because later the, um, the group in this Bolton did an even more aggressive cleaning experiment. Um, and they um, saw much bigger improvements in the completely different cleaning methods. So there's more evidence that something has to be you know, tackled as a technical issue. And uh, they saw about 100 times more. So we've seen a factor of two, there's all a factor of 100. Um, they used an, a method called argon iron cleaning. cleaning. So they actually take, um, actually have them in much trickier uh, method to use. Um, we actually have to let argon into your vacuum system and utilize and discharge any argon basically from the cleans off the surface. Um, so there's some encouraging um, uh, work that's been done there in the last year or so on uh, finally getting to grips with this sort of enormous heating problem. Okay. I'll back off from the technical issues and come back to. Uh, um, so I told you yesterday about how we make, um, for example, a two cubic gate using a laser static wave. That was the picture I had. Mm. This was the uh, um, picture in phase space. What happens to my arm was driven by this um, state-dependent, spin-dependent force, which fundamentally was coming from this traveling standing wave, traveling of the arms, um, for the <coughs> piece of mm -hmm. So how do we do something like that using microwaves? Um, so the basic idea here is that we still need a spin dependent force, and the mechanism is the same, so the, force, the physical origin of the force is different. Instead of coming from this, uh, the AC star chip from the electric field of uh, the optical field, it's now coming from basically a stern gluck force, effectively a magnetic moment mu. Um, there is a sending of magnetic field gradient, d by dz, there is a force. Okay, so it depends on the direction, just like in stern gluck. So Direction of, of the magnetic moment. The magnetic moment, of course, is uh, parallel to the spin, so we immediately have a spin dependent force. So, the thing you would think um, was the uh, problem that would kill this. So, if you remember yesterday, I told you that the um, where the force arises from is because your iron sees the gradient of the field, and that's an electric field, then that's on a scale. It's the um, of all the wavelength of the of a laser light around about 400 nanometers. And if I replace that laser light by microwaves, microwaves now with 3 gigahertz, that's a wavelength of 10 centimeters, you know, that big, it's about 400 nanometers, that big. Um, of course, we're given the field strength that that gradient is absolutely minuscule. Um, however, the exception to that is um, when you're working in the near field of uh, a microwave conductor or wave size I mentioned yesterday. So um, that enables us to think about, about doing this. So um, the uh, oscillating force here is um, exactly the same as before. You tune it near the qubit transition in our case about gigahertz. The the states involved in calcium 43, which has a structure in the ground state tree system, ground state qubit. Um, and the frequency of this force is close to so it's detuned by the track frequency and it's detuned by further detuning delta. And that's used to implement the, the, the different three different gates I told you about yesterday. That's the uh, the non-assault type gate. So um, there's uh, a few things you need to be careful of here. We want a field gradient to be by z, but we don't want a magnetic field. So otherwise we'll drive the carrier transition. So if you remember yesterday my picture where I had the, the qubit state up and down, and I uh, had the side bands in the trap. So that's the carrier transition, and that was the red sideband transition. So if I'm near this red sideband transition, I'm detuned by frequency omega z, the trap frequency from the carrier, um, and I definitely want to don't, don't want to drive that sideband. Uh, sorry, that that carrier, because that will, that will cause my qubit to start spinning while I'm trying to do the gate. Um, which I guess would be okay if I knew exactly how many spin flips, but it's like everything, um, it's, uh, uh, if you want to control that to high precision, you prefer it not to happen at all. And to compare with the laser gates, if you remember in the, in the laser situation, I had this lambda parameter, which described the ratio of the strength of the sideband relative to the strength of the carrier. Numbers. The effective Rabi frequency on the sideband was eta times the Rabi frequency omega on the carrier. In the case of lasers, that eta was um, around about 0.1. In the case of the microwaves, 
um, it's much smaller. It's not as small as you'd expect from a weight link, but it's still it's be much smaller, it's going to be more than 10 to minus 4. So by the time I've driven a sideband transition, uh, if I haven't suppressed that carrier, I've driven many, many qubit rotations, and I won't know where my qubit state is. So I would really want to, to avoid driving that. Um, and again, because of this smaller Landicki parameter, it's likely, at least initially in the first experiments, that these micro gates are going to take longer than the laser gates. They're actually going to be slower until we've uh, uh, sorted out the technological issues and get just physically pumping more microwave power into the trap. So another thing we choose to do is to um, look at one of, use one of these atomic clock transitions I mentioned yesterday. And uh, I'll just come on to that in a bit more detail in a moment. But let me stick with the gates first. So here's um, how we achieve this. Here's how we get our magnetic field gradient without getting a field. So imagine, imagine having three wires here, the three different currents. Now I've drawn them as DC currents, but they're actually oscillating microwave like currents. <coughs> Um, if I have three wires like that, the point above those wires, so this is going to be in my trapped substrate, my iron is going to be trapped in free space above them. These are the fields arising from those three different currents, so I want my two, my three, and the instant in time. Um, if I've got three, I've got enough degrees of freedom, and I can control the amplitude phases of those currents. I've got enough degrees of freedom to get a field gradients there, but no field. Okay, so in fact, I get a quadruple type of field, a bit like I do for the, the radio difference trapping potential. Static field here to define my quantization axis. Okay, so we're going to be called a uh, field gradient across that way, which is going to drive the, drive the motion of the arm uh, in one of the regular directions parallel to the trap substrate. Um, so I've already told you a bit about the advantages here, micro technology is more mature, and so on. Um, another important point is that we don't have any photon scattering in these gates. So from the laser driven gates, um, if you remember, I was driving those with a Raman transition up to a virtual state and then back down to this, this other state. And uh, if we're given laser power, um, I can only achieve a certain detuning from the real states rather than the the virtual states. That means I'm always going to scatter some finite number of photons, and that's going to also decrease my qubit. It doesn't have any micro No spontaneous emission of um, photons. Uh, a third very nice thing is that we don't uh, have such stringent requirements on the temperature of the motion of these ions, and that's that's a gain you get from having this small lambda parameter. So this small lambda parameter is a disadvantage from the point of view. It's more difficult to try these side bands. It's an advantage because, again, compared with the effective size scale here, um, which is now set by uh, the size scale of the microwave conductors in these traps, which is about 100 microns, then I don't care if my ion is moving about a bit the scale of uh, a few tens of nanometers than it, it might be if it's only cool to the double temperature. So I don't actually need to cool it down to, to motion ground states to use. Um, and some of the problems are that we need to uh, achieve this, this um, what is pole field here with carefully need to null the carrier um, while still having this gradient field. Um, so if I'm going to do that at the a sort of 10 to the minus 4 level here, I'm going to need a Gradient of stability in these microwave currents, phases of the microwave field. And if we really want to get the same kind of time scales as people <coughs> achieve with laser gates, 10 to 100 microsecond time scales, um, we're going to need large amounts of microwave power or large currents here in the trap uh, electrodes. And we're going to need to get the ion as close as possible to the surface. You can imagine the closer you get to the surface, the easier it is to make these gradients across that direction. Okay, so how, what's our technical uh, um, solution to this um, problem? Which is the first attempt um, is to build a trap that incorporates microwave resonant structures. Okay, so that's the new bit of technology. So, um, so zooming out from the middle, right in the middle here is the trapping region. That was rather like the picture I showed you of our first <coughs> trap. The talk. Okay, we've got uh, electrodes this way where the trap radio frequency is applied to and we've got DC finger electrodes coming from the side. Um, and what we're also going to do is put microwave currents through the same electrodes that we're using for the trap. The reason we use the same electrodes is that we can just get everything closer together. We 
to get this big gradient of the field to your microconductors close to the opposing currents that are visually gradients of the track. To get a decent um, radio frequency confinement for the trapping, you also want the RF electrodes close in here. You can't put them underneath each other, which means they would uh, electromagnetic shield each other, and also be very difficult to fabricate. So our solution is that, that because the radio frequency for the trap is around about um, 40 megahertz and the microphone is around about 3 gigahertz, we combine those very different frequencies in the same way. <coughs> um, so that's what we're going to do. And to build up more microwave current, we build a resonance structure around it. So from here to here is a half wave resonator structure for our 3 gigahertz microphone. So this is about you know, um, 2 or 3 centimeters long, the physical size of that. And uh, a nice feature of um, particularly sort of microwave frequencies we're working at is that you can make things like reflectors for the microwaves, you can mirrors for the microwaves, or uh, capacitors and inductive couplers, just by shape drawing different patterns on the substrate. It's all completely two dimensional. There's no real, you don't need to put a real capacitor there or an inductor. Um, so if you just, this just has an open end, there isn't it? This one just like a mirror. The other end, you couple in using. Lambda by four coupler, which is just well, in the pattern, this is a particular um, uh, dimension of the, uh, the conductor that goes into that. And that matches the resonator to um, what are called coplanar waveguides, which are also just patterns on the surface, and it's just a waveguide. Um, and again, it's a standard thing in microwave um, electronics. We just have the, where you can bring um, microwaves that they loss from one part of the circuit to another. It's just a, it's a two-dimensional version of a, um, what experimentalists will be familiar with as a BNC cable. Um, and so we can, the, the whole thing is designed to be um, a 50 ohm system, like most RF and microwave technology, so that you can match in with very low um, reflections from uh, the, uh, the track itself. So that if you have a general system, electronic system, if you get a lot of reflections from it, at least it can it. So, so I think it's designed to be a 50 ohm system. And we also want to put in lots of microwave power, potential power, to, to make this thing work. So um, this was all simulated in a uh, piece of software called HFSS. Um, you have to really simulate this. Um, I'm just trying to work it out with a pencil and paper analytically. Um, and uh, this tells you how the microwave, how the currents flow at microwave frequencies. Uh, this one, a noteworthy thing, here's the central trap region. Um, is the, the, and this is the intensity of the microwave surface current. One thing to note is uh, the current really flows on the edges of these electrodes. So it's very important, for example, to have a little bit of ground play in here in between these DC electrodes and the, the microwave electrodes to allow the microwave current to flow back. Um, and Diane will tell you more about these kind of simulations uh, at the to the, the, the next track of the year. There's uh, what the actual thing looks like. Gold um, on, in this case, a sapphire substrate. We use sapphire instead of quartz because that's good heat condu conductivity. If we can want to dump several watts of microwave power into these structures, which are only, uh, in some cases, 10 or 20 microns in size, then we want to make sure we can get heat load out before the thing melts. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, again, this is just pictures of the, some of the simulations. Okay, so we'll leave with that. Um, this, we've actually used this thing. Um, the track, not only does the track work, but some of it works extremely well. This figure of merits of the electric field noise, which is sort of what this graph is about here, compared with the other points from around the world, um, turns out to be one of the lowest, least noisy track things I've ever built. Mm. These, the rest of these blue points down here are all traps operated at cryogenic temperatures. Our trap is a room temperature trap, and it's, it's almost as good as those cryogenic ones. Um, and the ion is on time, part of the Below heating rate, that certainly stays in the trap for many hours. Uh, we move on to the actual cube results. So, the trap, um, as I say, despite the fact it's the first kind of trap like this anyone's ever built, um, it's before we really work. So, let's look at the cube that we've, we've used in that trap now. Um, so, here again are the ground level of class three. Um, it's got lots of states. Perhaps too many states for our taste, but that's it by the nuclear spin, can't do anything about that. Um, and there, is, there are various options for uh, these atomic clock qubits. Okay? The one I mentioned to you the other day was the obvious one. We have a transition between n equals zero states. 
in the ground state. M equals zero, as you know from your undergraduate atomic physics, does not have a first or a zero shift. So that's already uh, very insensitive to external magnetic fields. Um, the problem with using that is that the only place it really doesn't have a first or a zero shift is at zero field. And I've drawn that plot here. And then all these other states are degenerate. So I can't prepare, I can't isolate my two cubic states. So um, a better place, oh, if, just so we, we did some experiments on that few years ago. Those, those ones actually showed you before, and we got um, about one second of coherence time when we used this at a small but finite magnetic field. Okay, so we don't, we're not quite at the place where we get this nice um, uh, zero, uh, zero first order dependence, but nonetheless we've got a one second of coherence time. Um, if we increase the static magnetic field up here, this is the uh, same state, this is their energy or frequency here. Mega scale. Um, these, these, these are zero splittings opening out that are in two different high prime levels of x, y, and x3. Um, as I go over here, I go, I can transition from a weak magnetic field regime to a strong magnetic field, um, which again you probably may have seen in undergraduate atomic physics, going from so, the Zeeman effect to the passion back effect regime. And uh, when you um, diagonalize this um, system of states at uh, different magnetic fields here, um, the states mix with each other, so <coughs> and mix with each other, and, uh, and the energies here stop being a nice linear function and start curving around. So you can hardly see it on this diagram, but uh, uh, there is curvature. Okay, the middle, the m equals zero state, which is the middle of this point, transitions, and the middle of that state are not perfect straight lines. As you can see, that's perfect colors in the line. And that means you can find places where some particular transitions, the curvature of those two states matches. And at that point, you get, a, again, a field-independent transition. But all the other states are non-degenerate. Okay. So we, we can have the best of both worlds there. We can work at um, a truly field-independent point, And we can um, have the nice legs out cubic states. So that's what we've done. And uh, uh, as most things in the Armstrong community, nothing is new. This, this was first explored a few years ago at um, boulder in uh, beryllium um, cubits, and I think one of the reasons nobody's done this yet in calcium is because the laser cooling becomes very difficult because of these high line, high line states, or appears to become difficult, but we've solved that. Um, so just zooming in on the ground states again, the states of interest, and our clock cubit now turns out to be a transition to n equals zero, n equals plus one up there, and to prepare that state, we use the temperature of optical pumping, as I described, first section to get to this end state, and then we do three microwave transitions there. Three lines, we do just rather high pulses on each of those transitions, <coughs> and map the population down to there. Okay, so that's how you do the state configuration. Um, and the readouts I mentioned to you yesterday, the opposite of that, you take the cubit, one of the cubit states back to here, and then simply these are the electronic energy levels, you can transfer one of them to the shelf over there. So it's a, a fairly complicated procedure, but we can do that um, better than 99.9% <coughs> fit out. Um, so <coughs> we, here then the electronic states now the function of magnetic field. And as I say, this is one of the reasons that people probably haven't attempted to do this before, um, is that it's a mess of this looks more like a molecule to work like a they will we'll say this is peanuts compared to laser body molecules, but there are a lot of states there. So it looked like just the simple laser cooling to get these arms in the trap and keep them there was going to be true. Um, however, we've um, done the theory of that, or I should say that um, uh, my colleague Derek Stacey um, and the other graduate student, Hugo Yanachuk, have done a theory of that, and I've done this before, what's called block equation, <coughs> model of all the states here, um, and found a simple Dr. cooling solution, um, and this is just some uh, laser cooling data to convince you and experimentally, it's pretty easy. If you, in fact, need the same laser frequencies that you do um, uh, at low fields, there's not, not much difference in the low magnetic field and this intermediate field. Um, so, uh, the next thing we did have to do is find this magic field in the state, so we know in theory where it's going to be um, roughly, and we actually found zoom in and find this in the lab, so we vary the field around this field independent point about 140 Gauss. Uh, this actually, this really is data, sitting on this uh, parabola here. Um, and this is the frequency at um, 
3 gigahertz is measured in units of kilohertz, yeah, so it's just zooming in right on this. Like, and that's, that's the, the magic place where we sit with the transition heat, so it becomes first order of dependence. You calibrate magnets to your bulk in it, but uh, once you feel the transition is in the arm, so everything's done with the arm. Um, and if you go right to the center and then zoom in even more, this is now experimental data on a hertz scale, this is a kilohertz scale, and you can really see uh, the we tune with fantastic precision for the necessary field of dependence. So uh, that's this interesting technical stuff. Um, what we then do with this new qubit is if we're going to measure it's going to try and find out if we're really getting the advantage of this and it's a field of dependence, or is there something else going on? So we do exactly the same thing I told you about um, previously with the Ramsey experiment. Um, so this is a Ramsey experiment where we have a two second delay between our Ramsey first part of the two volts and second part of the two volts. We now scan the phase of the second part of the two volts here and we map our fringes. And I mentioned to you before, this is a piece of paper experiment on each data point here yeah, to get a measurement that one iron requires maybe a hundred repetitions of the experiment, a hundred repetitions of the two second experiment. So we've been pretty patient to get the data in the line. And you can see, I mean, there's certainly Okay, it's a bit noisy, but it's certainly evidence of doing it there at this two second time scale. And you then take a deep breath and do lots of these experiments and vary this, this um, Ramsey delay. And that's the data um, Tom Party um, got that visit the experiment in the lab. Um, and so you can see he's gone, taken Ramsey delays right up to about 16 seconds, which is the, the limit of our patients in the lab. But you know, each point there is hundreds and hundreds of experiments. So it's a pretty demanding on the stability of all the lasers and everything else. And if you just feel some exponential to, to that data, um, you get a coherence time of about 48 seconds, 48 plus or minus 10 seconds, um, which is about three times the best anyone ever measured in any physical system for a single cube. Uh, it, it seems unnecessary to go further, but nevertheless, we, for fun, as it were, masochistic version of fun, we tried the same thing with um, a CPMG sequence. So Martin Penny had told you about spinning on CPMG um, sequences in uh, his uh, first lectures yesterday. Um, and actually, primarily the reason I wanted to do this was to compare with uh, uh, people in other communities who, often in NMR, sort of state communities, they quote coherence times for their qubits, um, but always with some kind of spinning or CPMG protection. Okay. And they think, wow, it's amazing, I've got a one second coherence time, but they're actually putting you know, 500 spin echo protection pulses, which you can't necessarily do in, in the context of real QIP. Mm -hmm. But nevertheless, um, as I said, we did this for fun, and, and you then get somewhat less decoherence. And if you want to interpret that as a two time, it's something like uh, four minutes. Uh, so uh, that, that again is clearly uh, um, very impressive. Right. Um, the other thing we want to look at is how well can we do single qubit gates with microbes. So we think we ought to be able to do these um, in, with the, using these near field microbes much better than you can do with lasers or with shiny microwaves even from outside the apparatus. Um, and there's a, uh, a well known problem here, which is how do you measure the error of a, a single qubit gate if that error is lower than your preparation of readout? preparation of the readout errors. So I already told you uh, yesterday it's quite difficult to separate the preparation of the readout of errors for single qubits. And sometimes if you've got a quantum non dimension measurement, you can do it by repeating the measurement several times. Um, uh, the method of readout we have to use here is not quantum non dimension, so you can't, you can't do that. So you can't separate the preparation of the readout errors. And furthermore, if you do preparation gate readout, how do you separate it? The gate error from the others. Um, if, it's, if it's very much lower than the preparation of the readout errors. So uh, a solution to this was invented by uh, Manny Nill um, a few years ago, and it's called randomized benchmarking. And um, the recipe is, I mean, basically it's the first idea which will occur to you, I guess, of course, is you can do lots and lots, unlike preparation and readouts, you can do lots and lots of single qubit gates because they're you know, unitary operations or coherent operations. Uh, and then you can measure the error after lots and lots. Um, but the nice thing about the randomized benchmarking version is that you you don't just apply the same gates over and over again. Um, the claim is from the, um, from the theorists that it is to get a better estimate of what the uh, computation
computationally relevant evidence, you should do random gates because the real um, quantum computing algorithm is a gear operation using lots of single qubit gates. You're doing lots of single qubit gates in different, around different axes and four spirits. So you sort of simulate that by following um, resolution. You choose some random sequence of pivot uh, uh, gates um, to use, uh, I guess, theory speak, or uh, pi by two poles. And there's a 19 degree rotation on the sphere. But um, random <coughs> about the four possible axes, you can do that. You can do that about x. If you're starting, starting in, in, say, the uh, uh, state, you can rotate about the x axis in the plus or minus sense, and you can take about the y axis in the plus or minus sense. Okay, so you, you choose that random sequence first. Uh, and then you further randomize this by inserting pi pulses, or power gates, um, which are also randomly chosen. Uh, the power gates are randomly chosen from a set of eight pi gates with a plus or minus identity, which of course do nothing. Plus minus x, plus minus y, plus minus z. Um, and you come up with this uh, one sequence. I'm just using um, sorry, small x and y is left to sigma x and y operators, and the other line, the bar, is uh, just the minus x plus y, and similarly for the power gates there. And if you've done everything wrong, so if you don't have any errors, you're cubic, if you start from the upstate, you might always have any errors. And in doing so, you're sort of exploring the whole um, uh, trajectory of the, uh, around the block sphere. You should know where that cubit ends up. And so you apply a final pulse at the end. So you rotate it back in the measurement basis. <coughs> so you rotate it back in to say it's been up. And then you measure it. And if it's there, everything's worked well. If it's not there, you've got never. So you just do this over and over again. And more importantly, you do it with different random sequences. Um, and then uh, find the error of all these different measurements. So uh, this has been done uh, a few times, actually. It's been done um, <coughs> in trapped ions. Uh, the body group has been done in trapped neutral atoms uh, at this day with the, um, And it's been done in uh, NMR experiments as well. Um, so uh, when we did this, uh, we got some astonishingly good thing. Uh, in fact, so astonishingly good, I didn't believe it could be true. For some time until we uh, repeated the experiment and actually uh, uh, it, it explored the situation. So, what you see here is a measurement of the net fidelity of everything, uh, so state corporation, lots of randomized computation gates, and the state measurement after a varying number of computation gates going up to about 2,000 um, computation gates. So, so, in other words, 2,000 of these um, hyper 2 pulses interspersed with pi pulses. Okay, so the physical number of gates there is, is up rather more than like a, about 4,000 physical gates. And you can see the fidelity is only increasing with this starting off with our combined progression and weed-out um, measurement. That's what, the, that's what intercepts <coughs> the y-axis gives you. Um, that's what you get the next state progression we have to you know, apply any of these single gates in 0993. That's already about an order of magnitude better than anyone's ever measured. Um, for the state progression we have, and the slope is the error for the computation gate at just over one part per million. Okay, that's about 20 times better than anyone else's club. So, um, the previous best result uh, for the trapped ions was about 20 parts per million. Uh, this bolder neutral atoms, which I think is the next best result over that, is about 100 parts per million. Um, so, I'm <coughs> very pleased um, with these results. Um, in order to check that we really understood what's going on, I mean, at first I thought, well, what's going on here? I mean, this is the kind of fidelity decay you expect if you don't do anything. Okay, mm -hmm. We've got this fantastic long T2 time um, for about 50 seconds, but if you work out what, what that is, the time of these experiments it takes about 100 milliseconds of that order to do that many gates. Um, the amount of fidelity decay you, you expect just on the basis of T2 levels, perhaps that's my first thought. Did you actually switch on the microwave synthesizer and actually do anything at all? Um, but the beauty of the randomized benchmarking method is you, you've got this long string of pulses and you put your cubic back in the measurement basis. And you don't, because you can't, you don't always put it in spin up. Sometimes you put it in spin up, sometimes you put it in spin down, but you know exactly what it's going to be. So you get all these measurements. Uh, if you weren't doing anything, um, the cubic would just stay in its uh, zero state, be initialized. Okay. So, it's all done with the micro, so, so something is definitely happening there. Um, and then, of course, what we did is we made things worse. So, the classic thing you do experiments where you have something unknown regime, you change, in this case, the 
put in a more sequence lab is because you change the microwave power of it, change the microwave frequency of it, and uh, compare that with a model. And so we did the model first. Well, we're experimentalists, so our idea of a good time is getting the results to fit the model, the other way around. We did the model first, made the prediction, and then uh, and check that works out. And it so um, I just want to emphasize that uh, you know, that's, that's how the, I have to squash the graph up there from comparing the previous uh, best result. Okay, so that's a summary of the results there on this new um, qubit we're using, um, which is, as one said, professional readout, an error of 17 times 4, but in time of nearly a minute, single qubit gate area, error of about a part of a minute. So that's a nice place to be, but of course that's all the single qubit stuff in there. That's not so interesting. So, so the next step we're working at the moment is the uh, micro qubit, two qubit logic, which is what uh, Travis actually designed for. Um, and that is, of course, much more challenging, but um, uh, I think it's quite doable. And that's currently be done only in one experiment in this room just last year. Uh, they have achieved that. Um, and it's got to be down to about 80%. So that's actually comparable with the very first laser driven gates that uh, anyone ever made in the mine traps going back about 10 years ago. So uh, that's where the state of the art is with a micro driven two cubic logic. The other extremely important feature that we need to be able to demonstrate, we as a community need to be able to demonstrate, is that you really can do useful single qubit addressing with these microwaves. So the scheme for that is because you're close to these microwave waveguides, um, it's not the microwave wavelength which determines the extent of the microwave. So I've made that point uh, several times already. So if you have multiple trap zones, you know, if your traps are a millimeter apart, because the, the microwave waveguide has a 10 to 100 micron structure, you can conceive of addressing this trap with a microwave waveguide underneath that, this trap over here with an independent microwave waveguide under that. Now you're always going to get some cross tool, but if you can measure what that cross tool is, you've got these two way lines. You can cancel it out by having a microwave current in the opposite direction with 180 degrees phase difference under this trap and this trap. And uh, Diana will tell you more about that, because she designed a, a trap to do exactly that. Okay, um, so I will finish there, and of course, um, I haven't done much to contribute to these results. Um, it's uh, mostly the, very much the hard work of uh, everybody else in the group. Um, so the laser cleaning experiment I've done, <coughs> done by Luca Guglielmi, who's visiting us from Paris, and David Alcock. Um, microwave experiments that were done by David. Tom Harty, Diana, as I mentioned, is uh, uh, designing the next generation of trap. The theory which backs up these experiments was done by Derek Stacey and Hugh Bergnacci. And that, thank you for your attention. We have time for a few questions. Uh, no, I, I have a question. Sure. Um, so, how do you think in the future uh, iron trap technology will scale uh, for kind of schemes with one big trap and many ions in one trap compared to kind of schemes that have many traps with single or few ions? Um, I, th I think definitely the route with many traps with, with few ions. I mean, I, okay, you know, both techniques are clearly impossible, but <laughs> <laughs> nevertheless, we'll be pursued. I mean, it's, you know, I think, you know, it's, it's, I think it comes down to ultimately engineering efforts. And is somebody willing to pay for that and to do it? So, uh, you know, at some point, building the really, really big quantum computer is, is just a huge um, engineering challenge. And uh, I'm not sure, you know, we, uh, particularly as a business community, should, should be doing that or particularly interested. I think that the interesting physics that comes out of it is that once you get to this level, 20 or 30 or 40 qubits, and you're studying um, entangled states, in, in just, you know, you're in a new regime that people haven't been before, and uh, therefore you can hopefully do uh, useful uh, interesting simulation stuff um, well before you can do useful quantum uh, computing. Okay. Any other questions? In, in the, at the beginning, you showed Andy Sweden's thing, and Something like 3,000 laser beams. So, what, how many watts of laser power would you need for? Right, well, that's a very good point. That's and why then how would you phase off? Yeah, very good points. Yeah, that's why, I mean, that's why microwaves are so interesting, right? It's, it's much easier to think about the electronic problem of feeding into <coughs> different microwave um, cables, if you like, to your trap and controlling the phases of the microwaves. 
very well. Okay, all the basic jobs. I mean, um, I, I think I made the point already that building a constant computer or even building a single really good qubit, um, you need to have, it's like building a very good atomic clock. I mean, just to make these coded time measurements on a 50 second time scale, you know, our local oscillator micro needs to keep pace with the qubits um, on that time scale. Right? We had to lock up our micro source to first a very stable resonator, then to the GPS timing signal. Um, in order to make sure that we do uh, sufficiently stable for those experiments. And that just gets more difficult, of course, with many qubits. You would have all of them that they keep track of their phases. It's fantastic high precision. But I think I would make the claim that that's technologically easier than microbes. Going back to your question about the laser, the, um, the laser power is a very interesting question to, because to do high fidelity <coughs> gates with lasers, um, if you really want to get the photon scattering from off resonant transitions down to the 10 to the minus 4 level, this requires um, a board of 10 to 100 milliwatts in the laser beams that are doing a gate from just two qubits. Right? You've then got to multiply that. If you, if you to do really quantum error correction in parallel across a huge processor, you can't just do a gate here and then a gate here. And you've got to do all that in parallel. So you're really talking about tens of watts of uh, laser power. So it's, it's very, very challenging. And uh, even the phase stability, of course, is, is really tough. So, I mean, people are working on this kind of problem. The, the guys at Sandia um, have built, uh, started building integrated optics into the ion So they can take an optical fiber, <coughs> uh, particularly this planar design, and they bring that optical fiber in underneath the plane of the trap, like a hole in the trap, a little lens, all microfabricated, and they can bring a laser beam and focus it onto the ions or collect the fluorescence from the ions. And, you know, this is starting to look a bit more scale. Right? And imagine having lots of, lots of these optical fibers and building them out in a bundle um, from the trap. I mean, you don't think you could, I didn't show you a picture of the apparatus, but it's all free space optics and systems at the moment. You know, that doesn't feel like it's going to be scalable. But, um, that, of course, is, a, is another uh, attraction of microwave techniques. You need fewer lasers. The lasers are used for doing the state regression and readout. That requires microwatts per qubit, microwatts of laser power. So it's much, much uh, more feasible to think about scaling that. Okay. Let's thank uh, the speaker again.